when I go, wherever I go in the world, people come up to me and they're usually, I wouldn't say they're happy to see me. They're often in tears. We can do whatever the hell we want. And we're telling you, you better go get re-educated or you face a disciplinary hearing. The rise and fall of Jordan Peterson's career is a cautionary tale to the dangers of speaking truth to power. The legacy media uh, types are, they're done. They're so done. It's, and it's happened so fast. I notice among young people that the legacy media, the big magazines, the newspapers, the TV stations, the radio stations for that matter, all of whom had a monopoly on this kind of information flow, are so dead to people under 30 that it's as if their death isn't even noticed. The backlash against Jordan Peterson was swift and severe, a sign of the times that we live in, where one misstep can lead to a public vilification and the loss of everything that you've worked your entire life for. The Ontario College of Psychologists, which is the board that regulates the practice of psychology in Ontario and hypothetically protects the, pro the public interest, has levied a series of what are, in essence, lawsuits against me for um, unprofessional conduct pertaining primarily to my social media communication. They have decided in their wisdom that I am to be required to undertake a series of re-education lessons uh, designed to ensure that I communicate in a manner they deem appropriate and I have told them that there are no circumstances I can imagine under which I would be willing to do that. And the next step is to bring me before a public disciplinary hearing and then to suspend my clinical license. What happened to Jordan Peterson is a chilling reminder that even in a world that values free speech, there are those who will stop at nothing to silence those with whom they disagree. And I've also been trying to figure out what I'm doing with the podcasts themselves, because that's really what I've been doing a lot of for the last four months. And I listened to this, I was interviewed by a Wall Street journalist last week, and I asked him what he liked about podcasts, because he listens to them a lot, and he said, I really like to see where they're going. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly it, because in a legacy media interview, everything is scripted, and you're never talking to a person. You're talking to the corporation, essentially. And I'm not being cynical about that. It had to be that way, because bandwidth was so expensive. But now, you can sit down with someone, and you can risk exploration. Of course, that's what Joe Rogan has been doing so well for so many years. You can risk exploration. You can have two people having a genuine discussion about a complex issue. And so they're, they're engaging in dialectical thinking. And if they're good at it, they're modeling it. So they can model high quality dialectical thinking and pull people along on an exploratory journey and make it permanent. And that's completely revolutionary. That's never been possible before. And 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 the possibilities are limitless. And then, sorry, I'm gonna rant about this a bit because I, I am so st continually staggered by this. The next thing is you can take those conversations and you can chop them up into 30 second pieces, a minute long pieces, five minute long pieces, 20 minute long pieces, and each of those can find a specialized home that can attract millions of views. And so it's as if you could write a book and sell it by the sentence. It's, it's really something. And I can tell perfectly well when a podcast discussion is going well, and it's a dance, right? I mean, there's, there, there has to be this continual reciprocity, and that requires you to attend very carefully to your guest and to listen. I have some trouble with not interrupting because for a variety of reasons, but some of that's the technological lag produced by, the, by Zoom and Skype. It makes you a little less, uh, what? The dance is a little more awkward because the timing is off, but it, it's it's really fun when it works, and it's working much of the time when I'm talking to my guests. It's really exciting. In two hours, you reveal your hand, and everyone can see it. You reveal the weaknesses and strengths of your argument. You reveal the weaknesses and strengths of your character. You know, but but in some sense, you can even if your character is flawed, like all of our characters are. You know, if you're engaged in something genuine and in, in a genuine move forward, you're forgiven for that. 
right? It, it, if, if, you're, if you're actively rectifying your evident flaws during the discussion, people will forgive you for your flaws, but YouTube and podcast long form seems absolutely unforgiving of any <laughs> falsity, as far as I can tell. I mean, sometimes we do some editing. Eh? There, there's two conditions under which we'll edit. One is just to edit out some technical glitch. We also allow our guests um, the option of not having something they said broadcast if they believe they've made a factual error or addressed an argument um, in a misleading way. And that's a li little bit more of a moral quagmire, but our thought is that if we allow people that veto power to begin with, they're much more likely to be loose and to take risks in the exploration. And we've had to cut virtually nothing except I think two factual errors of a few seconds, but it's so interesting because in the comments section, if we ever edit anything, there's skepticism right away. You can make mistakes, but 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 if if you're bargaining in good faith, the audience will forgive you for your for your mistakes. So, but but you're punished brutally if you're false. So, and I don't know about you, but I'm really attentive to the comments. I watch how people are responding. And, you know, if 10 people point out something, I'm still working on this proclivity to interrupt. But if 10 people point out something, I try to address it. My team tries to address it because, well, why not? You know, I mean, you're probably doing something wrong at some point and enough people will tell you it's tricky. Worse than that, People underestimate the significance of this because it isn't, we're not having a fight about who has the right to speak freely. That's nothing, that's, that's, that's a peripheral problem, even though that can be serious in and of itself. We're having a fight about whether or not your claim that free speech exists is nothing but a masquerade for your willingness to dominate and use power. And mm -hmm. so if I was taking that tack, I'd say, it's all well and good for you to speak about free speech, but look, you're white and you're middle class and you're British and, mm -hmm. you're, and you're privileged, and you have this theory about free speech that your ancestors derived, but the only reason they ever derived that to begin with is so they could exercise their power. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as free speech. That's just a lie to mask a power claim, and that's a way worse cynical criticism of the notion of free speech. Yeah. Well, kindness is tricky, you know, because one of the things you deal with very commonly if you're a clinical psychologist, apart from depression and anxiety, is, well, behavior therapists offer assertiveness training. And now, the pe people who need assertiveness training are all often people who are too agreeable, compassionate, polite, by temperament. Now, the problem with that is that they let every other they let people walk all over them because mm -hmm. they don't they don't stand up enough for themselves and the consequence of that is they get resentful and then they get bitter and then they get conniving and then they get and then they'll mob and so because they're not they'll do anything for everyone else but they push themselves beyond their limits mm -hmm. and they and then they won't even recognize the limits because they feel well if i'm not doing everything for you then then i'm not a good person so, and so they have decided in their wisdom that I am to be required to undertake a series of re-education lessons uh, designed to ensure that I communicate in a manner they deem appropriate. And I have told them that there are no circumstances I can imagine under which I would be willing to do that. And the next step is to bring me before a public disciplinary hearing and then to suspend my clinical license. And so I'm making all of this public because I think people need to weigh in on whether I'm an alt-right Nazi harmful, uh, you know, bastion of, of intolerable political thought with a troll-like army of pathological followers or whether the college itself is a corrupt nest of social justice vipers hell-bent on envy and revenge and using the tiny fraction of people who are complaining to put forward their own brand of personal pathology and vindictiveness. And, well, I'll make everything public except for that which I can't do on legal grounds and let everybody decide for themselves. That's the plan, because I might be wrong, and uh, I guess if I am, I need to learn how. The regulatory boards that govern professional conduct 
in Canada particularly, in the US as well, and in the West more broadly, have become so corrupted by the woke ideology that the professionals you depend on in moments of crisis for legal advice and medical advice and psychological counseling, some of which can be life and reputation saving, they can no longer be trusted because they're being required by the professional bodies to lie to you in the service of this warped, um, radical leftist ideology that's now become, what would you call it, mandatory for right speakers wherever they might exist. And so that's why you might want to listen and decide for yourself whether you think that might be true. Before I submit myself to this media training re-education, because I'm bound by the ethical standards of my profession, I'm not willing to go get educated unless there's evidence that the contents of the educational program are directly related to the practice of my profession, and that there's evidence that undertaking such re-education actually makes me a more competent therapist. Do you have any independent documentation that these experts that you have hired and foisted upon me have anything approximating genuine expertise? And do you have any evidence whatsoever that such training programs are effective? <laughs> and of course, they said, uh, we don't have to answer questions like that. And I asked them, I said, you know, there's some evidence that I've done some good in the, in the world. Um, about 7 million people bought my first public book and I have 15 million subscribers on the three main platforms we operate on on social media and uh, lots of people seem to come to my lectures when I am out publicly speaking saying that I've really helped them in their lives and that's thousands or hundreds of thousands or possibly even millions of people and so I think I can stack up a pretty good plus all the students that I taught at Harvard and the University of Toronto and all my clinical clients um, who by and large were pretty damn happy to be working with me and vice versa. It's like, how do you calculate the harm to benefit ratio? And uh, you know, what evidence do you have that I actually constitute a sufficient threat to the integrity of the profession that you're willing to bring the second harshest actions you have in your arsenal against me? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that was, we don't have to answer questions like that. And I had like 40 questions like that, none of which were answered. Their answer basically was, we can do whatever the hell we want. And we're telling you, you better go get re-educated or you face a disciplinary hearing. That's the next step, is that I'd have to face a disciplinary hearing. Well, now when I go, wherever I go in the world, people come up to me and they're usually, I wouldn't say they're happy to see me. They're often in tears, you know, and they often have a pretty rough story to relate. You know, they were suicidal or nihilistic or homicidal or trapped, desperate, you know, and they tell me that real fast. And then they say, I've overcome that to a large degree and thank you for that. And, and you think, well, that's really something to have that happen over and over. In some ways, you might think, well, how could anything better possibly happen to you than to have people come up to you all over the world, strangers, and open themselves up like that, like they're old friends, so quickly. But at the same time, it's an awful thing. Because you see, even in the revelation of their triumph, the initial depth of their despair. So I wouldn't change that. But it's not nothing. And it's certainly not just happiness. It's better than happiness, but it's almost unbearable. There's this admission of a deep suffering at the same time as you get the beautiful transcendence of the music. And that's meaning, you know, that's awful in the most fundamental sense, but you need an antidote to suffering and it has to be deep. And you know, deep moves you tectonically and it's not a trivial thing. And But that's better than happiness. And maybe if you're lucky while you're pursuing that and while you're immersed in it, you get to be happy and, and you should fall on your knees and be grateful for that when it happens. You know, it's a gift. It really is a gift. And it comes upon you unexpectedly, your happiness, you know. But 
You aim to climb uphill to the highest peak you can possibly envision. And that's, that's better than happiness. Some programs you, you cannot predict, right? You cannot predict how they're going to end. You have to run them. Well, you know, I believe that truth will save the world. I believe that. So you speak truthfully and you watch what happens and you take your consequences. You know, and maybe you hope and have some faith that in the final analysis, things will work out in your favor, but perhaps they will and perhaps they won't, but that's faith, eh? That's faith. It's faith isn't believing in things you regard as ridiculous, sacrificing your intellect. It's a decision, you know? Will truth, beauty, and love save the world? Well, you can find out. How many of you know what chat GBT is? Now, AI is, you know, it's a threat too, but if we, if we, were, if we had our act together ethically, it's possible that AI could become a, a useful servant rather than a tyrannical master. Jordan Peterson, renowned for his sharp insights and frank opinions, delves into the very core of the issue, warning us about the impending danger of AI, a warning that cannot be ignored. They're always after the next new thing as fast as possible, so it's a machine that's speeding along as fast as a machine possibly can. And, and God only knows where it's headed in some sense, right? Because there's so many things happening at the same time that it's impossible to keep track. And we don't even know what these things are. As Peterson articulates his fears, you can't help but feel the weight of his words. His warnings echo through your mind. He paints a bleak picture of a future where the line between humans and machines blurs and we lose sight of our humanity. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world, and so they'll practice just like scientists. And the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well, because they'll be able to model human action. Now this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just gonna make your hair stand on end within the next year. Because there is so much transformation going on in that domain. And, and that's been the case, particularly for the last six months, that it's almost unimaginable. How many of you know what chat GBT is? Okay. So I'll, not very many. So I'll tell you what chat GBT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. Gutenberg press level? It's something like that. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and or of text. Peterson's words are a call to action, a wake-up call for us to come together and address the pressing issue of AI. As we seek to advance our technology, we gotta remember to protect our humanity or risk losing it altogether. AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon, and that's basically what scientists do, right? Because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world, and if the hypothesis and the world fit, then you think, well, that's scientifically verified, and Keller thinks that, that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon. And pretty soon means as soon as someone builds one that can do it, because the tech is already in place. And so, I have no idea what that's gonna mean. You know, and it could easily lead us astray. So here's something that's gonna happen in the next year. So imagine now you're a lonesome, lonesome guy and you can, uh, you can get a digital friend, woman, and uh, she can talk to you like ChatGPT talks to you and listen like ChatGPT listens to you, which is maybe if you're really lonesome and alienated, more than anyone has ever listened to you in your life. And then soon, she'll not only listen to you as a text interface, but she'll be a fully rendered 3D, well, 
let's say, 2D photorealistic, fully rendered animation indistinguishable from a genuine image of a person, image of a genuine person, and then that'll be 3D for your, you know, Oculus headset, and then, well, that'll be sexual in like just right now. That'll be the, that'll be the value proposition, right? Is you'll be able to turn your virtual girlfriend into your virtual sex partner, and who knows what that'll do? Robots have been tricky, you know, but I can't imagine that's more than 10 years away. And that's just one thing that's going to happen, maybe not even the most surreal thing. You know, pretty soon we'll be contending with the fact that someone will be able to generate a photo realistic version of Donald Trump and have him say something absolutely reprehensible and spread it everywhere just before election night. And there'll be a real confusion about whether he said it or didn't. So what do we do when our representations of reality can be falsified? Now, you know, I was talking to my son about that today and he thinks we'll get into an arms race right away because there'll be technologies that can detect whether video is artificial. But then, you know, there'll be a race because other technologies will learn how to fool that technology. And, you know, maybe we'll be able to stay on the edge where we can still detect what's real and what isn't. But I don't think we're doing a very good job of that right now on social media, you know, because social media, it's kind of like the world, except it's way more demented. And the problem with that is that it makes the whole world look demented. So my concern fundamentally is that these machines will reflect us ethically. And that should be frightening because I wouldn't say that our ethical house is particularly in order. So they're going to magnify what we are. You know, so, you know, the Google guys can talk about the mind of God, but that's making the presumption that the thing that we're building will be a good thing. And I don't think that it will be a good thing because it will reflect us. You know, you hear babies have no theory of mind. It's like, uh, yeah, no, they can imitate. That's pretty bloody amazing, man. Like you haven't seen robots that can do that yet. Although there are robots now that you can teach by moving their, their arms. You move their arms and then they'll do it. And so you can actually program them by moving them and then they'll just repeat it. And so they're getting damn close to imitation. They're really getting close and then look the hell out, man. Because they're going to be imitating each other as well as us. And they're going to do it so fast, you just won't be able to believe it. You now the guys that are building the autonomous cars, like they don't think they're building autonomous cars. They know perfectly well what they're doing. They're building fleets of mutually intercommunicating autonomous robots. And each of them will be able to teach the other because their nervous system will be the same. And when there's 10 million of them, when one of them learns something, all 10 million of them will learn it at the same time. So they're not going to have to be very bright before they're very, very, very smart. Because us, you know, we'll learn something. You have to imitate it. It's like, God, that's hard. Or I have to explain it to you and you have to understand it and then you have to act it out. We're not connected wirelessly with the same platform, but robots, they are. And so once those things get a little bit smart, they're not gonna stop at a little bit smart for very long. They're gonna be unbelievably smart, like overnight. So, and they're imitating the hell out of us right now too, because we're teaching them how to understand us. Every second of every day, the net is learning what we're like. It's watching us, it's communicating with us, it's imitating us, and it's gonna know, it already knows in some ways more about us than we know about ourselves. You know, there's lots of reports already of people getting um, pregnancy ads or ch ads for infants, sometimes before they know they're pregnant, but often before they've told their families. And the way that that happens is the net is watching what they're looking at and inferring with its artificial intelligence. And so maybe you're pregnant and that's just tilting you a little bit, right? To interest in things that you might not otherwise be interested in. The net tracks that and it tells you what you're, what you're after. It does that by offering you an advertisement. So it's reading your unconscious mind. So, well, so that's what's happening. After humans become completely dependent on AI and we either merge or become a zoo, where can we find meaning? <laughs> well, there's a lot of hypotheticals in that question. Um, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that because 
I don't, I don't think it's within the scope of anyone's vision to, to, to predict even what's likely to happen over the next 40 years because the rate of technological advance is so insane that in some sense all bets are off. And I, I really mean that. Um, you know, I, I have a variety of contacts in Silicon Valley and there are people there that I've been communicating with who believe that it's already within their power to build a, an AI machine that will have higher computational capacity than the human brain. That's within five years. Now that assumes that they've got the computational capacity of the brain properly calculated, and that's not necessarily the case. But even if they're out by a factor of 10, that's not many iterations past that. Now maybe we don't understand the brain at all. That's certainly possible. It isn't just the rapid increase in computational power that's doubling so quickly. I don't know if any of you, how many of you watch the Boston Dynamics videos? So, how many of you don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, so one of the things I would highly recommend is that you go home and go to YouTube and, and look up Boston Dynamics, because it's the most advanced robotics company in the world, and it was a DARPA project, so a, an American defense uh, company, and they were bought by Google five years ago, and they had pretty damn impressive robots five years ago. They were autonomous, and, and uh, so they could, they could uh, make their way over rough terrain, including snow, up hills. If they slipped on the ice, they could right themselves. If you pushed them over, they could pu put themselves back up. And that's not joystick controlled. That was all autonomous. And they ran on gasoline-powered motors and were capable of, of autonomous action for an hour and a half or so. And I looked at the last iteration, and it's a small robot about this big, and it has a hand that looks like a head. And it's so sophisticated that it can, it can gyrate to music spontaneously, and it can keep its head in the same place while it does it, like a chicken. And so, and it can open doors, and it's like, it's, it's quite the remarkable creature. And, and the, the rate of advance from the first robot, which was called Big Dog, which is a very terrifying thing to, to, to watch Big Dog, to this is quite staggering, and that's only going to increase insanely that, that ability over the next five years. And you know, there's something very strange about robots that people don't generally think about, some people do. Imagine you have a robot, and it can learn a few things through imitation, and we already have robots that can do that, because you can program a robot, industrial robot, that's worth about $20,000. You can move its arm the way you want it to move its arm, and then it will move its arm that way. Imitation is coming up very rapidly, and the capacity to autonomously learn is already there to some degree. Let's say you have a robot that can learn a little bit, not much, but then let's say you have 20 million of them, and they're all exactly the same, and they have exactly the same architecture, and so what that means, as soon as one robot learns something, then all 20 million of them learn it.